we go once again to the book of Genesis in the very first chapter. Uh, we'll finish chapter 1 today and at the end of the message get a little bit into chapter, chapter 2 and then uh, next week we'll talk some more. Uh, the day is uh, about what I can believe is in called God's greatest creation. And, uh, and, and I'll give you a, a disclaimer, I guess. I'm probably going to say some things this morning that uh, you haven't heard before and that uh, you may find a hard time believing it, uh, but that's all right. It's the gospel. It's the word of God. And then I want to encourage you to please be back next week because this, this takes two weeks, two sermons to get the importance of this, uh, this, uh, this part of creation. And uh, next week, uh, we're going we're gonna to see why marriage is supposed to be considered such a holy thing. Uh, and we're going to learn a lot about ourselves next week. And if you think today I'm out of my board, you wait till next week. Uh, because what I'm going to share with you next week is going to knock your socks off and rock your boat. And you're going to say, we never heard it on that fashion before. Well, you're going to hear it next Sunday morning. And we're going to hear the truth of God's word that, uh, that I, uh, I've i been a Christian a long time and, and I'm the only one I know I've ever heard preach what I believe the book of Genesis says, teaches, amen. Now that doesn't mean that they're all wrong, it just means that my eyes may be open a little bit wider on a few things. The rest of it I have problems with, but this I don't. All right, if you'll stand with me and honor reading God's word, Genesis chapter one, we're gonna begin reading at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielded seed. To you it shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and, us, and so everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me, our food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And Father God, once again, I ask you, Lord, to add your blessing to the reading of your word. Father, in the moments ahead, I pray the Holy Spirit to take your servant, body, soul, mind, and spirit, and allow him, Father, to bring this message as you would have it to be presented. God, that the truth of your word will come forward and prepare us, Father, for next week when we see even greater truth concerning who we are. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said, today we come to God's greatest creation. At least, phrase phase one. Uh, the creation of God's greatest creation takes two phases. We got phase one this morning. Next Sunday morning, we'll look at phase two and see the complete story of how God created his greatest creation. Some will disagree with some things I say, but that's okay. I say that human is God's greatest creation because it's the only of the things that God created known to us that God was willing to send his son 
to come to earth to suffer and die for. Amen. As wonderful and as great as everything else God has created, including every planet, every star, all the spaces in between us and His throne, the greatest of all of these is the one that God would say, Son, go down and die for your children. Bring them, redeem them for me. Uh, I hope to show you something that I believe is most important about human beings, which I believe is going to be right here in the scripture. Uh, the danger of taking two weeks to do this, two different services is somebody not being here next week, or those coming next week is what here this week. Amen. But so I hope that whoever's not here this week will get a, a, a DVD or, or a CD of the service. And then uh, also those that, uh, that can't be here next week, be sure to get next week's message because it takes the two together to see the true story of human beings. And, 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 uh, and I think it's so important and, and why God has so much to say about marriage and the, and the sacredness of marriage and, and what it should be all about. So um, anyway, uh, I can't do it all in one day because you wouldn't want me to be here, stay here all day. So let's get right to it. The beginning, first, for the first point, the beginning of human in uh, verses 26 through 31. And God said, now you remember last week, what did, we, what did we say that, that what action is taking place? What does it mean when the Bible says God says? It means God spoke it into existence. He said it and it is. It's that simple. Whatever it says and God said in creation, it means he said it and it is. Right. Not going to be, but it is. It's actually right here. But here, what God speaks to exist is something, it's not something for earth, but something for himself. If you look at what he says here, God speaks differently, and he says, let us. God speaks, so what he speaks is going to happen. But in what's going to happen is the next part of, his, of his, what he says, and he says, let us make. So God's speaking something that's definitely going to happen, but then he changes it from speaks to makes. And what do we say that make means? It means it's something that God is literally going to do. There's some action involved on the part of God. When he says speak it, he speaks it, he speaks it into it. But when he says I'm going to make it, that means just like if I say, I say, somebody says they're going to make a cake or bake a cake. It means you're going to take care of put all the ingredients together and you're going to come out with a cake. Hopefully a good one, you know. And, and everything. So God here, God the Father is speaking. He's speaking to God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit. And he says, let us three, who is God, make our greatest creation. God who can make and create anything he wants to. There's nothing that he can think of that he can't have. Or cause it to be. So here he says, so here the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is going to literally do something to make this greatest creation. Now listen to this. God here takes counsel with himself. God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. So when he says, let us, this is so important that now he says, let us counsel together. God counsels with himself. He said, this has is, this is got to be just right. And the reason this has to be just right is that one day the Son will become one. Think about that. Before any of this is happening, God already knows that mankind is going to sin. God already knows that because God, mankind is God's greatest creation, that when mankind sins, that it's going to take the greatest forgiveness to forgive the greatest creation. And the, the greatest forgiveness has to be completely and totally holy in every aspect, in every way. And the, the only person 
that meets that criteria is God himself. Now, God the Father couldn't come because he is the father of all. He has to sit as the as a, as a chairman of the board, so to speak. The Holy Spirit couldn't come because he's got other things to do as well. In all the things that's going on, the Holy Spirit would have things to do. So the only one of the three who'd come to earth and, 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 and hang on that cross, come on Good Friday and hang on that cross is Jesus Christ. They already knew this before they ever said, let us make man. They knew that Christ had to come and suffer and die and be resurrected. They knew that it had to be Good Friday and it had to be Easter Sunday when it did this. When it says, let us make man, in the King James Version, the word, and God, I want you to understand this is so important because sometimes people, when we read the Bible, we, we read words, and once we read a word, we think it's the same word throughout the Bible, and it's not. It may be the same in English, but it's not the same in Hebrew, nor is it in, in Greek. In, in the New Testament, it's not the same in Greek. So this week and next week, we're going to have to be very careful that we understand this one word and where it's used and when it's used to, to get the idea of exactly who we're talking about. And here it says, let us make man. Now that word is pronounced autumn. Let us make autumn. In English, it's spelled in lowercase a-d-a-m. Adam, but in lowercase. Not uppercase. We'll get to that. Not right now, we're not. So right now, it's, it's what God says is, let us make autumn. Let us make autumn. And that is, as I said, that's spelled A-H hyphen D-A-W-M. And that means human being. Let us make human being. And that, that's why that whenever we refer to the human race as, 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 as mankind, and now some of the liberals are unhappy with that. They, they want it to be some other kind of kind. But the word we're talking about here is the word human, autumn. You know, God created autumn kind, human kind, when he said that. To the best of my knowledge, the word human is not found anywhere in the King James Bible. But the word autumn is, autumn. We find that, and that's what it means. It's this Adam we're talking about is not at one man, one male. But rather, this is the human race that we're talking about. Uh, where some versions say human, the King James will always say Adam. So make no mistake about it, what's being created here on the second half of the sixth day is us. Phase one. We have changed in phase two. But phase one, it's us, the way God created us. Here's the special part, verse 27. Let us create, let us make this human, these human beings in our image after our likeness. Image here refers to resemblance or figure like. The word likeness here refers to manner. So what does that mean? It means that human looks like and acts like God. That's what it means here. Let us create our greatest creation which will look like and act like God. Now, a lot of people think that, boy, I'm just being sacrilegious when I say that. But when I, what I'm saying is that when we get to heaven, God on the throne, we will not be all that shocked because God will look like us. In reality, we will look like Him. God created us to stand upright and look like Him and act like Him. Now, don't get me wrong. I look out here and I see a lot of men and I see a lot of women. 
And not one of you look like me. But on the other hand, every one of you look like me. Yeah? Put on a wig there, put on some lipstick here, you know? <laughs> get a stogie here, you know? Get a powder puff there. But, but you all look like me, yet you don't. So when God created us, He created us with genes. I believe that's the right word for it. That causes us to be identifiable, including our fingerprints. Don't you find it amazing and unthinkable that in all the world no two sets of fingerprints ever match? Out of the millions and millions and millions and millions of people that have been on this earth, no two fingerprints ever match. Only God can do that. That's right. We go to the paint store. Pick out, we want to paint something in a room, and we go to the paint store, and we, we see all these covers on the wall down at that Home Depot or whatever, and we say, oh, my Lord, how did I choose? That is nothing compared to God's paint chart. That's, right. that's just a spectrum of what God had. That's how great God is. That's, that's how great God made us. Some people say, well, preacher, you're trying to make God like human. I say, no, I'm not. I'm trying to make human like God. That's what God's trying to do with this whole book. Right. He's trying to make us like Him. Because we're to be like Him. We're to be His presence on earth. Christ hasn't come yet. We're to be His presence at this stage on earth. We're to look like God. We're to act like God. We're to command like God. That's what he's saying here. I believe God made human to resemble what he looks like because as best I know, the only creation God has prepared a home for with him in heaven. Not only is Jesus going to become one, but we're the only one God's made a provision for to go to heaven. Nothing else on earth goes to heaven. I'm sorry, pet lovers. <laughs> Nothing goes to heaven from earth except the human spirit, the human soul that's been redeemed. That's it. Everything else, including earth itself, God has no use for. He can make billions of everything else. But he's chose to limit himself as how many humans he creates. We don't know what the total number will be, but God does. There will be a limit to how many humans are created on this earth. And God knows what it is. God made them like the angels. God made the angels long before earth's creation. He made all he's ever going to make at the same time. He broke the mold. Shut down the factory. When he said, we're going to make angels, he made every one he's ever going to make. And he made them all with no reproduction possibility. Second point. God gave human a job to do. Right off the bat. Here you are, you're going to work. Verse 26 still. He said, let them them means more than one. God, you don't say them to one. I don't. I don't say Fred them. I say Fred he. It's always got to be more than one to be them. This is before anything is ever said about Adam and Eve. Now here are the difference on the ADAM. Adam the man, the individual, is capitalized as it's supposed to be with a capital A, capital D, and a little AM. But now until we see the rest of what we're going to see, humor me a little bit, and let's say that God did not make a human, but made humans, with plural. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the rest of that next week. But for now, what I'm saying to you is that when 
When God said, let us, let us make humankind, that's what he meant. He created the human race. And I believe the language of the scriptures is he created more than one. And that'll be important next week. Next week, this week, not so much, but I'll throw out any kind of preparing you about that for next week. So that would mean there is a number of these humans on earth. The job gives human is to have rule, dominion in the King James over all the earth, which means the complete earth. God says, I'm creating humankind, creating humans, and this is your job, to have dominion, to have the rule, to have the authority over everything on the earth. No exception. So God's plan was that he could create it and forget about it. In a sense. That's my words. Because he would have us he wouldn't worry about where the fish may swim or where the birds may fly or what crops we may plant. We would take care of all of that. Every law, spiritual law, godly law concerning earth, he gave to mankind, humankind. That was his purpose. Now, if this rule is over the complete earth, what would not be, what would, what would be excluded from that? Nothing. Complete room. And that brings us to point three. And another biggie. I want you to see again, humor me. Look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, God created human in his own image, in the image of God. This included both the form of the body and the uprightness of it. That's what those words mean. This was different from and unlike any other creature. None of his other creations did he make in the form of an upright. Just does. This body is created in agreement with Christ, the Son, who's already been agreed with one day be one of us. This body, with all that it may or may not include, does not mean that it resembles what it, it, it does mean that what one resembles will be what one resembles what they will see when we stand before God. We can't be both. We can't be in his likeness and his image and then not be. We either are or we are not. Well, have you got any scripture on that? Yeah, there's a lot in the Bible. Those individuals that had lived and left that God called upon to come back, they were recognizable not only by Jesus, but they were recognizable by the apostles that went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with them. They recognized who these individuals were. They were what we would call long dead and gone. But Christ brought them with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, or he met him up there, and they recognized him. So just humor me a little bit. We're going to get some scripture in a moment. Look at verse 27 again. Male and female. Human is not only created to resemble God and exercise God-like power on earth, but it's also created both male and female like God. God is both male and female. Some people don't like hearing that. Some people will tar and feather me for it. But God is both male and female. There is no female God to create females. There's only one God. And he has to be both male and female, and in Genesis, when he created human beings, he created them just like him. Only at a lower level. We have power on earth, but not over the universe. God maintained that. I want to share two different passages of scripture with you. I'll be closing for too long. 
One from Matthew and one from Galatians. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 29 and 30, this is what it says. And Jesus answered unto them, now, you may remember this, is that somebody came to him and said, Lord, I'm trying to trick him up. Trying to trick him up. Lord, uh, Sally Joe here married Bill. Bill died. Then Sally Joe married Bob. And they're all dead now. In heaven, whose husband, who did I say, Betty Joe? Yeah. Sally Joe. Uh -huh. yes. Sally Joe. Sally Joe. I didn't think I said Betty Joe. <laughs> Sa Sally Joe. There's a reason why I didn't say Betty Joe. <laughs> Sally Joe. He says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Get that. A lot of people say don't know the scriptures. No, it says you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Amen. For in the resurrection, they neither marry now nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Say, I won't make this stuff up. I just go to the rest of the Bible and see where it's at. And then in verse 38, I mean, the, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, 27, 28, listen to what Paul says. For you all are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The only way you become a child of God is by faith in Christ Jesus. Those others claim it, not so. Verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, not in water. If you, if you are not in Christ, when you get in the water, you're just getting in the water. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. What Christ does is bring us from this mess that's going to start next week. Back into one with him. Amen. We're going to see that. You, I promise you, it'll make sense next week. Maybe not, but I, I hope it does. <laughs> all Christians need to understand that God is both male and female. But he's all, it's always referenced or referred to in the masculine vernacular. He's neither male nor female. He's actually both. But he's always referred to in the male vernacular. That means that, and angels are the same way, and they don't have wings, they don't reproduce. Humans in Christ and God in heaven are also the same. Now listen to me, it is totally in error, inappropriate, and disrespectful to ever refer to God as she. I know that's a big thing now. Uh, you get on some of these you special people on TV, they love to talk about God's sheep. That's a modern thing here to refer to God as sheep. That's disgraceful and disrespectful to God. Because you're lowering who God is. He has everything there is in a male and a female, he has in him. But he also, he always looks and acts like his masculine side. He is the father. He's not the mother. Who's the mother? The church. The church is the mother. God is the father. All right, let's go on. The last point. Fourth point. In verses 28 through 31. Wait a minute, it does, get this. In verse 27, let me say this. In verse 27, them, again, there's no Adam, there's no Eve, they're just humans. Both are male and female each, okay? Now, last point, verse 20 through 31. Well, next to the last. The blessing, there's three things included. The blessing, the instruction, and the conclusion. Here's the blessing, verse 28. And God blessed them, humans, with all the blessings of nature and providence, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, 
and providence with all the good things of life, with his presence and with communion with himself in a natural way, and particularly with the power of procreation, which at this point human could not understand. God often gives instructions that humans are first at first don't understand. Now imagine, human is both male and female. But he blesses them and says, you're going to reproduce. That had to blow their mind. They could not have understood what that even meant. You're here, you're a man and a female in one body. And God says, you're going to reproduce. Lord, how in the world am I going to do that? Remember that time I told you, be simple, it was like a hen just going in the corner and lay it. But it ain't that way. That's not the way people reproduce. But God gave them a blessing that they were going to reproduce when they were male and female in the same body. And I, I say that blew, I'm sure it blew their mind. But he says, he blessed them with his presence and communion with himself. Then he gave instructions in verse 29 through 30. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you shall be food. And to every beast, so on and so forth, everything was a vegetarian. Everything was a vegetarian. Mankind, fish kind, bird kind, insect kind. Every living creature upon the face of the earth were to eat vegetarian style. God did not say that when that word meat there is not meat as we call it, it's the word food. I give you this for food. I didn't give you the fish for food. I didn't give you the animals for food. I gave you what grows on the plants and the trees. So there is something to this about being a vegetarian. We don't like it. We don't like it. But there's something about that being healthy by eating vegetarian style. And we're not going to go any further than that. I know most of us, we like our steak and baked potatoes. So anyway. So he gave the instructions for that. Then the conclusion in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, not good this time, it's very good. And that term, very good there, if you look it up, it means vehemently good. I don't pronounce that just right, but vehemently, you say, it's all I say it. Vehemently. There you go. That, that, that's, I mean, it's not just very good, it's outrageously good. <laughs> it's as good as good can get now. That's what that means there. It's right here in the band. Let's have a dance. Let's have a party. We've got them. We've got humankind in our likeness and in our image. And they're vegetarians. And I'm going to eat one another. <coughs> How wonderful it is. And then there's one last thing. And that's in the next chapter. Chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3. And this is very important that we get this down pat. And God said, Behold, well, it goes on, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then verse chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens, heaven 1, heaven 2, and then heaven 3 was already there, were finished. And all the host of them, everything in them, all the stars and planets and everything, and then all of us, everything on earth, and on the seventh day, not the Sabbath, but on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day <coughs> from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God knew that humans, every week that humans 
would need a day off for rest. So I'm thinking, well, wait a minute now. We only work five days a week. Well, you fortunate ones only work five days a week. Ask these farmers how many days a week they work. And some on overtime. That's not right. We shouldn't be doing that. But that's the way life is now. God says, and even with a five day work week, what do most of us do on Saturday? The sixth day. We do a whole lot of stuff. I have two of these men over my house, and they work like dogs. And I shouldn't say that's being cruel to dogs, I guess. But they work like old plow views, as I said earlier. In my, they did not rest yesterday. They worked hard. And they smelled a lot and took in a lot of smoke in their systems. The people who run the stores or work in the plants, they've got to have time to do their yard work and do work around their house. So we usually do something on Saturday on our day off that requires a lot of a lot of movement, right? A lot of energy. So God says that in this six days you get all that done. But on the seventh day of the week you take a day of rest. Now it doesn't matter what day the week begins on, on the seventh one you need to take a rest. And now here's the interesting thing about it, the reason I brought it up. Years ago the medical profession, and this is back when I was young minister, just in the beginning in the ministry, uh, the medical profession did a lengthy study, and they concluded that God knew what he was doing. Praise God. <laughs> they concluded that the human body, in its design, needed every seventh day to rest from their labors. They also concluded that not doing so would lead to various medical emergencies and shorten a human's lifespan. People who work seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, they are shortening their life. That's right. Human being, I know sometimes it, it, it's a necessity, but we should never have set up the idea of having people work every day. That's a devilish thing. And these plants, I don't care what it costs to restart those machines. If they can't get enough of the lost people to have two different crews, they ought to shut them down. That's right. <clears throat> and I think most of them do give their people some day off. Well, they may not give off one the whole week, but next week they give three or four. But the idea is human beings need their day off. They need their day of rest. But be your women now. Why do we have church on Sunday? Worship on Sunday is the respect and recognition of Christ Jesus. He arose on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Sunday is not the seventh day of the week. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And uh, but uh, Jesus arose on the first day of the week, and thus we have a new covenant. All of this in the Old Testament was under the Old Covenant. Now, in the Old Covenant, there were several different versions of it. You may not know that. There were. But in the New Covenant, there's only one version. It's been the same for over 2,000 years now. The New Testament is one covenant in the New Testament. So God did not need to rest for himself, but created a day of rest for humans so we wouldn't work ourselves to death. I've known people to have three or four jobs. They shouldn't have to have three or four jobs. The Bible says a laborer is worthy of his heart. What would the worthy of a hire be make a living? Every human being should be able to make a living without having to work like three different human beings. Some of you are old enough to remember what happened in the 50s after the war, World War II, and all that. 
When I was born, a young boy, and I'm going to close in just a moment, very few women were in the workforce place unless they had dedicated themselves to be like Paul, not have a family. Paul said, I, I can't, now my job won't let me have a family, I'm not going to have a wife, I'm not going to have kids. And the women, they did what God commanded them to do in the Bible. They had the babies and took care of the home. And the men went out to work. And guess what? It didn't work. We didn't have many people that were starving to death. When I was young, I don't know if anybody in the Gordon County was considered homeless in Gordon County. It worked. The men out working, making a living, the women staying at home, making a home, it worked. And somehow in that working, even if people never went to church a day in their life, they had a great respect for the church. And they had a respect for the Word of God. And they had a respect for those who said they had received Christ as were Christians. Even though they may never go. Because they recognize that the whole thing is from God. But I remember, as some of you will, that we got to having things pretty good. We got to have a little bit better cars. We traded our mules in and got tractors. <laughs> we traded our John boat in and got a motorboat. And then we started being able to take what we call some vacation time. And then it wasn't a day, it was a whole week. So then we started going up to Gatlinburg. And then those that didn't want to go up to Gatlinburg, they went down to Jacksonville Beach, Florida. They had the mountain lovers and the ocean lovers. And for that week, we took a whole week off the family and went on vacation. When we got back, when we got back, the men went to work, the women stayed home and had the babies, which is a full-time job. The working mother has two jobs or three jobs. Actually, three. Got the job of a wife, got the job of a mother, and then got the job of a work. So if anybody needs a rest, ladies, a job. Now, nobody will disagree with me on that, right? Not you ladies anyway. I'll get y'all on the side. <laughs> y'all go home and tell your husband, you stay off of here, well, and we try. <laughs> now, but something happened. As things got better, we weren't even better cars. We wanted better trucks. We wanted better tractors. We wanted better boats. We didn't want to just go to Gatlinburg and Jacksonville. We wanted to go to Hawaii or Europe. And all these things take money. Plus, we didn't want to have this plain furniture and stuff in our house anymore. We wanted to get something a little fancier. And we wanted a bigger house. God forbid we even decided we wanted the indoor toilets. <laughs> And we put them in. But all these things cost money. Well, then some of the men said, asked to get the people at work, do you reckon my wife can go to work? She's talking about it. She could work. We have more money to do anything. Well, sure. I think we can work that out. Boy, that's the devil talking out there. Yes, so what did they do? They brought the women into the everyday workforce. And now, They've got two workers paying one wage. Mm -hmm. Instead of the man getting the wage he should be getting, now it takes two of them to get that. So yes, they got more money, but they put this poor housewife who's a mother and a wife and a home working there, which is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And now they've got her having to work out here at 8, 10, 12 hours a day beside her husband. Why? Now it's not the boats. But like now it's just to provide a roof over your head and food on your table. Huh. Preacher, we ain't heard that. Well, it's just the truth. It is. Some of us grew up to know that. That it's when women became strong in the workforce that the wage became unlivable. The wage was no longer a living wage. It was only half a living wage. 
And then you really had to succeed to get up here if you wanted one person to make a living wage. Well, why don't you say all that to remind us it's hard. It's a hard life. It's tough. And in that toughness of everyday life now, it's tough for that husband and wife to have everything rosy. When you're tired, you're weary. When you're worn, you're not excited about doing things. You're excited about sitting down and being alone and having peace and quietness for just a short period of time because you know tomorrow or the next day it starts all over again. And our tempers get more sensitive. And we start yelling at one another. And then we start yelling at the kids. And we start blaming them for everything. One of the things, now we're going to do a little series on the family, but you know one of the things that, that, Paul, that Paul teaches, the Bible teaches about in the family, about parents and children? It says, parents, do not exact, exasperate your children. And what that means is, set your standard, set your rules, and stay with it. And I always, when I, when I teach that, I give this example. One day, mama's mopped the floor, kitchen floor. All right, little Johnny has been down the fishing hole. <laughs> he comes back with mud on his shoes, and without thinking, he goes in the kitchen door, runs across that freshly mopped kitchen floor in the other room, and mama said, oh, does it Johnny, I say little Johnny, little Johnny, little Johnny, uh, you know what you did? You, you track mud over my clean floor. That's all right. Did you catch any fish? Yeah. When you go in the room and play, I'm going to have to mop this floor again. Next week, Johnny goes fishing. He comes in the same kitchen door.